When you stay at a Verbo, the host doesn't stay with Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. This is the Rotary Club in Fort Worth, and we are so delighted to have you here. On this day in 1954, Elvis Presley was inducted into the U.S. Army as Private Number 53310761, and he was sent to Fort Hood right here in Texas. Given some of our special guests today, that seemed especially appropriate to mention. And now let's get on with our meeting. With the invocation, Steve Kessler, VP of Financial Consulting at Fidelity Investments. And also on uh, National Anthem at the Piano, Wesley Gentle. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, if you'll pray with me. Today, I ask that we all give thanks for our meal, our fellow Rotarians, our friends, and our families. As we cope with public shootings, like the ones this week at Lamar High School in Arlington, Thomas Jefferson High School in Dallas, and East High School in Colorado, and wars like the one in Ukraine. I ask that we pray for those who have lost their lives or been injured to senseless violence, their families and their friends. I ask that we pray for improved mental health and better decisions by those who invoke such violence on others and for their souls. I ask that we give thanks to our military and first responders for their service, duty, and interactions with the aforementioned. And I ask that we give thanks for all others who make our experience on this earth peaceful, enjoyable, and fulfilling, for it is through them where we feel your love the most. Amen.
And now Dana Fitzpatrick, Director of Inclusive Programs and Community Engagement at Tarleton State. She's gonna help us introduce our guests and visiting Rotarians. Good morning, everyone. Today we have Ruth Marquez, guest of Akua Anyanfu. We have Mandy, thank you, welcome. We have Mandy McWhorter, guest of Kirk Driver. Miles O, guest of Tim Halden. And Sean McCoy, guest of past president Courtney Lewis. We also have a few guest Rotarians. Bruce Stacy, who's president of Colleyville Rotary. And Jim Quick, no, I'm sorry, member of Arlington Rotary. I've got a guest today. Yes. Charles Lawrence Gordon, and he's a Marine. Ah, welcome. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for your service. On that note, we do have a very special sponsorship today. Uh, on behalf of our very own Rotary Veterans Committee, I would like to thank them for sponsoring today's meeting. The committee manages the club's resources earmarked for projects benefiting local veterans, service members, and their families in need. One such project is to provi provide shelters to homeless veterans. Contact Dick Riddell or Aurora if you would like to join the committee or make donations. Remember also to donate to our endowment when you pay your membership dues. Thank you to the Veterans and Military Affairs Committee and especially those who are behind the sponsorship, Chairman Dick Rudell and committee members, Carol Del Real, Bill Fairley and Don Click. Thank you again, Veterans Committee. And now, as is our tradition, and you know, we've got some special young ladies, uh, some guests today, you're going to be hearing more about them momentarily, but it is indeed our tradition here, as it is your tradition at your own meeting, to recite the four-way test. These 24 words um, typify all that we think, say, and do as Rotarians, and so let's recite them together. One, is it the truth? Two, is it fair to all concerned? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And four, is it beneficial to all concerned? You know, this is our 110th anniversary. And so, young ladies, we are particularly celebrating our club founding. Our club was founded in 1913. And again, this is 110 years. Now, as we reflect on our history, it so happens that today, uh, or this month, March, is Women's History Month, which seems especially apropos given our esteemed guest from the Young Women's Leadership Academy. The National Women's History Alliance spearheaded this designation, and they have announced this year's 2023 theme is celebrating women who tell our stories. On the slide are two trailblazing women in Rotary. Dr. Sylvia Whitlock from the Rotary Club of Duarte in Duarte, California, uh, she, in 1987, she became the president of her Rotary Club, making her the first woman to hold this position within Rotary International. The club's charter had been previously revoked in 1978 after they violated Rotary International or RI policy by admitting women. The Duarte Club filed suit in the California courts claiming that Rotary Clubs are business establishments subject to the regulation under California's Civil Rights Act, a law that bans discrimination on race, gender, religion, or ethnic origin. RI appealed the decision to the U.S. Supreme Court, and on May 4, 1987, the U.S. Supreme Court confirmed the California decision supporting women uh, in the case of the Board of Directors, Rotary International v. Rotary Club of Duarte. After that ruling, Rotary International ended their policy of gender restrictions. <laughs> and here we are. Also shown on the slide is our current Rotary International President, Jennifer Jones. She is a member of the Windsor, Roseland, Ontario, Canada Rotary Club. Her selection as this year's current Rotary International President is another groundbreaking first 
She indeed is the first woman to hold the office of Rotary International President in the 115 year history. So to bring it back home to our own club history, within our own club, Sam Lane was our club president from 1986 to 87 when all of this was percolating. Encouraged by the Supreme Court rumblings uh, and the final decision which would admit women into our club uh, did not occur until the following year when Ken Barr uh, was president of our club from 1987 to 1988. Our members voted overwhelmingly in August to admit women to membership within the Rotary Club of Fort Worth. During the first half of that year, nearly 20 women were elected into membership. As Ken wrote at that time, the opportunity to select members from the growing number of women business and civic leaders will help assure the club's continued health and vitality and its role as one of the most important forums in our community. So I would especially like to recognize Ken Barr um, and our past presidents, Judith Carrier, Zim Neal, and J.R. Labby for their own tra trailblazing footsteps that have led the way for the rest of us. <laughs> and now we're gonna quickly get to a few other announcements. Um, Rotary Night with the Fort, Fort Worth Opera is coming up. You know, we love having the opera come. They come almost every year and people often, people usually tell me it's one of their very favorite programs. And now it's our chance to, to prove it to the opera. We need to support our, our arts community. They are giving us a 25% discount. And the discount is good through next Friday. They are holding a block of seats on the orchestra floor. And this is a district mixer. Our district governor will be there. There are some other folks. I'm hoping some folks from Colleyville come and join us, Arlington, um, but certainly, We'd love to have as many of you as possible. It's going to be, the, uh, the QR code is there. It's in the rotograph as well. It will be at the Van Clyburn Hall at TCU. As many of you may know, Van Clyburn was a member of this club, and he was also a major donor to the Rotary International Foundation. Um, this hall that we're in, it is relatively intimate, especially for a grand opera. So it's really a treat to have the performance in that um, space and it's known for its pristine acoustics. I will also let you know if you're an, an, op uh, an opera novice or you're just not quite so sure what you think about opera. From a survey conducted by the Royal Opera House, Verdi's Aida was selected as a great first experience opera for beginners. This is because it is such a visual spectacle taking us back to ancient Egypt with grand costumes, headdresses, jewelry, gems, scenery, and a full chorus. It is literally a feast for the senses. So I'm hoping you get your tickets before next Friday. And by the way, the discounted seats are normally 125, they're down to 100, but there are 50 and $75 seats to be had. They're simply not discounted, but pick any seat. And we're having a reception at 6.15, about 45 minutes before the program. Uh, next announcement, District 5790 Assembly for Leadership Training, Saturday, April 15th, it's $25. I'm en encouraging all of you to attend, certainly if anybody on the board next year, certainly um, committee chairs, but any active Rotarian. It's 8 to, I think, 2 p.m., and it's just some basic additional uh, rotary training and some fellowship with members throughout the district. Also, next uh, Friday, May 18th to Saturday, May 19th is the District Conference in Mineral Wells. You are all welcome to come. It's really a celebration of District Governors Dan, Dan Steele's year and various projects and accomplishments within the district. And now, Ann Sheets, CEO, retired, Campfire First Texas. She's going to tell us what's going on in her newscast. Thank you, Sean. Well, it's been a busy week. Donald Trump announced that he was going to be arrested this week, but as of this morning, he hasn't been. Yet another broken campaign promise. <laughs> <clears throat> and Congressman George Santos, the former Olympic athlete, astronaut, firefighter, Rotary International president, and I suppose butcher, baker, and candlestick maker, has decided to run for re-election. 
After a nationwide survey, the only two groups who were pleased with his decision were late night television hosts and rotary newscasters. <laughs> According to columnist Andy Borowitz, Kevin McCarthy was spotted this last weekend mowing Marjorie Taylor Greene's lawn. It appears that the deals McCarthy made to be elected Speaker of the House are catching up with him. While the Speaker was mowing, Greene emerged from her house and appeared to tell him that he missed a spot. When asked about his chores, McCarthy said it was just something he wanted to do. He reportedly also cleaned uh, Green's gutters and oven and is scheduled to come back next week and clean her attic. And in other news, according to the New York Post, more than one in 10 Americans believe there will be a zombie apocalypse and the number one state to take on the walking dead is Wyoming. California was the least likely to be prepared for a zombie apocalypse and I'm proud to say Texas followed close behind California as the second least likely to be prepared. In this case, it's nice to be in the bottom two. <laughs> Nearly 25% of Americans reportedly don't find it weird to prepare for a zombie apocalypse, and more than one in 10 already have food stockpiled. If we have to start stockpiling food, I think the first thing we should stockpile is the bread pudding from the Fort Worth Club. <laughs> As long as we have bread pudding, we can deal with anything. Meanwhile, Florida governor and likely presidential candidate Ron DeSantis went on a nationwide book tour to promote his new memoir in which he states, and I quote, I was geographically raised in Tampa Bay, but culturally, my upbringing reflected the working class communities in Western Pennsylvania and Northeast Ohio. How convenient that his cultural upbringing was credited to two major swing states. <laughs> One might guess this guy's running for president. Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, I'm still waiting to find out where he got his fashion upbringing <laughs> because that's not a good place to be raised. <laughs> and speaking of presidential politics and elections, there have been talks about reforming the presidential election process. I have an idea. I think we should adopt the Miss America system. Just look at all the positives. We have not two, but 50 individuals to choose from. There's no campaigning. No one insults the other candidates in public. The winners known at the end of the night and the losers all smile and offer their congratulations. I'm not sure, however, that we'd be able to name a Miss or Mr. Congeniality. Tough crowd. <laughs> and speaking of tough, it was a tough weekend for the TCU Horned Frog basketball team. After winning a nail biter against Arizona State, the Frogs missed moving on to the Sweet 16 after running into the Gonzaga Bull Bulldogs. But we continue to be proud of our Horned Frogs, and now it's on to baseball season. Regardless of the season, go Frogs. Oh, yeah. Monday was the first day of spring, and the weather forecast for this weekend is sunny with a high in the 70s. Be careful if you're working in your yard, and have a great weekend. Thanks. <laughs> And there you have it, all the news you don't need to know, but she's really in our Hall of Fame. She's one of our great newscasters. Now, um, Bruce Stacy, former uh, Fort Worth Rotarian, and he escaped over to Colleyville, but he's got an announcement with the Air Power Foundation. Council, President Stacy. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. I have an opportunity for Fort Worth Rot Rotarians, and um, many of you know that Frank Kent and General Curtis LeMay started the oldest military support organization in the United States right here in Fort Worth. It's um, the Fort Worth Air Power Council. There's also a foundation which supports it. But nonetheless, this organization is capped at 200. We just ran the roles and the roster. We have nine openings. So if there's anyone here that feels a little bit guilty because you didn't serve in the military at some point, this is an opportunity for you to serve 
without wearing a uniform. So this organization supports the reserve base, also supports their families. And it is an opportunity also to become engaged. For instance, we have a trip to Fort Hood, Texas, the 17th and 18th of, of May coming up that you'll be invited to to go down and get a command briefing. But the organization is has nine openings. And since it was founded right here, it's an opportunity for those of you that are involved in business, never served in uniform, to become involved and to learn more about the military. Thank you. Incidentally, I'll be sitting right over there. I'm collecting business cards. Thank you very much for bringing us that opportunity. And now, Matt Sylvia, Executive Vice President, is a senior lender with First Financial Bank, and he's also facilitating the inaugural year of our club's very first Interact Club at the Young Women's Leadership Academy. Matt. Okay. Uh, thank you, President Sean. Um, uh, very happy to uh, present uh, the Young Women's uh, Leadership uh, Academy as our official Interact Club. Um, first off, uh, President Sean, board members of uh, the Rotary Club, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for supporting these young ladies here who have uh, taken this from a de novo club in October. Um, and uh, I know Judge Randy Flew can't be here, but his better half family is here. So I want to thank uh, Judge Randy for that, for leading the charge on that. Um, Randy and I have had many phone calls where we're asking, is it too late? And um, it's never too late because uh, this is a this is a well deserving organization that we're trying to help out here, and and as part of the uh, pillars of Rotary. Quick recap: the club was started in October of uh, 2022. And uh, the members here, um, they all came here to um, their meeting at the uh, school. And I don't think anybody really knew what we were going to be doing, including myself, because I was trying to go back to 1996 when I was in Interact. And, and, uh, but they've done a great job leading and uh, showing uh, the capabilities of what it takes to uh, start a club. Um, they meet regularly. Uh, the third Tuesday is when they don't meet. Um, and they're uh, this close to their first uh, fundraising event, which they decided to have the proceeds go to Polio Plus, something that we're all very uh, close and uh, fond of in ter terms of uh, uh, a basic pillar of Rotary to eliminate polio. Um, we wouldn't be here, though, without one, the club's support, but also most importantly, with the administration's support of, from Young Women's Leadership Academy, uh, the club advisor, Dr. Cantu, and, um, and these young women here that are here today to uh, do that. They're all very bright. They're committed to their education and giving back to their community. And um, one of the things that brought them here was one of the basic pillars of service above self with the uh, facet of being in Rotary. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce President Elizabeth, who will be uh, giving some comments uh, about the club. Hello, my name is Elizabeth with an A, Alanis, and I am the first president of Young Women's Leadership Academy's Rotary Interact, first Rotary Interact Club. And before I continue and give my remarks, I would like to introduce my fellow board members because they're the ones that help make the club that much more functional, enjoyable, and diverse. Please, I'd like to introduce my vice president, Kyla, treasurer, <laughs> Lorelai, Secretary Tierra, historian Tiana, and then the board of directors, Silali, Aubrey, and Stephanie. And I'd also like to give props to our sponsor, Dr. Kant too. She volunteered. Now, what this club has meant to me is it was a way for me to challenge myself by placing myself in an unfamiliar environment and deciding to just go head on and go immediately for the leadership role. It definitely gave me a chance to practice my leadership skills. But for others, it was a way of being able to give back to the community and serve. And it was also a way to 
have everybody have a voice to where it's actually heard, no matter the role that you get, everybody gets to talk and everybody is heard and listened to and everything just matters what everybody says in the club. And it's nice to be able to have ideas, do the planning and actually go through with them rather than just keeping them as ideas. But overall, it definitely has been just an enjoyable learning experience. And I just wanna thank you all for your support um, never have been, wouldn't have been, a bit, ooh, ooh, <laughs> wouldn't have been able to do any of this without all of you. Thank you. So I'd like to make sure that um, first off, uh, for those of you that sponsored the the club's lunch today, have given presentations at our club and have served on our community. Steve, Wendy and Maddie here today. Um, and if I mentioned, forgot to mention anybody else, I apologize, but um, I'd like to thank all of you for making time out of your day to support these ladies too. So what we'll do, we'll uh, present them with their uh, official banner here. So, perfect. All right. We get a picture. Ready? After one, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And that is that photo was on their Founders Day, October 24th, 2022. And uh, young ladies, just as we now, literally, we look back and we celebrate our club founders. One day, the young other, the future young women uh, interact students will be celebrating each of you with that photo. Uh, so now we have a few other quick announcements. Our MBA, Richard Knight, the Rotary Minority Business Award. He's COO and Vice President of Knight Way Services and on deck is James Emmons for a Crazy Pants Golf 2023. Come on up. I, I'm on the clock, so uh, I've sort of got to be brief. <clears throat> uh, today, I'm, I'm giving you guys a twofer. I'm here on behalf of both committees that I chair First, the Rotary Minority Business Awards. We're fast approaching the day of the ceremony, and I'm excited and anxious at the same time to have the opportunity to showcase some outstanding businesses operating here in our community. Uh, all the work the community has done thus far would be completely in vain if not for the sponsors listed on the screen. We'll just give them a quick break, round of applause. And two, two quick recognitions. First to uh, THR, who just last night added their name to the list. Thank you, President Sean. And to R.D. Howard Construction, I saw Mr. Howard somewhere, who has increased his sponsorship level to the forward sponsor uh, uh, level amount. So thank you, Mr. Howard, appreciate that. Uh, folks, there's still time to get your name added to this impressive list. Uh, please uh, take advantage of that opportunity. Secondly, the, the Community Outreach Committee has decided to partner with the Women's Center by recruiting a Rotary 5K team. I know, a 5K again. I'm sorry. But uh, the event will be on the 15th, I'm sorry, <laughs> from 8.30 to uh, at Trinity Park. And I'll be doing signups in the back afterwards. If you're interested, come see me. Hey, just a quick note, update on the uh, Crazy Pants Open, May 16, Grizzly Gunter Club, uh, South Course. Uh, we've uh, done very well. The committee's done a great job getting sponsors to help us on this program. We all we lack so far is a title sponsor and a dinner sponsor. So uh, that's coming along very nicely. But I want to remind everybody, this is a golf tournament for all the members here as well as non-members. Please reach out to people and we want everybody to join in and have a fun event because that's what it will be. It's got great uh, entertainment, not to mention all the great, great uh, fellowship. So uh, we also uh, want to remind people too, you don't, if you don't have a team, sign up.
because we'll try to match you up with anybody else that uh, is a single or otherwise. So we already got two, by the way. So please uh, uh, sign up online, see me, David Campbell, Courtney Lewis, uh, Jason Ellis, Blair Hancock, Austin Spinney. Any of us can help you through. Not only that, Aurora is here to help as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nettie Compton, come on up. She's our secretary-elect. And while she's coming, I'll remind you that DNM Leasing has provided, there's a vehicle, a $40,000 vehicle, if you can do a hole-in-one at the right spot, at the right time. Come on. Good afternoon. We have two first readings today. The proposed members are Robert Vargo, President and CEO, Resin Technology, Inc. His classification, Technology Consulting. His proposer, Frank Shields. The second, Zoran Gutik, Sales Manager, Autobahn Motorcars. Classification, Auto Dealerships. Proposer, Natalie Wilkins. If no written objections are received in the Rotary Office by March 31st, these proposals will be given second readings and voted on by the club. Thank you. That's fabulous. Membership is our lifeblood. We love new members. Keep them coming. And speaking of new members, we have a new member introduction. David Campbell, Vice President at Hewitt Zollers, and Andy Thull, please join me on stage. So you might have seen Andy around here. It's taken us about four months to find us both in this room together, so I apologize. Uh, Andy relocated to Fort Worth with his wife, Kristen, from Southern California, because California is not ready for the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it was only slightly. Right, right, exactly. Uh, he grew up in Minnesota, Kansas, and Colorado. Uh, he spent 15 years in Southern California. Happy to be here, though. He moved here last year. Andy has a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Colorado and owns Woden Fire, a building code consulting and fire protection engineering firm with four offices nationally. Uh, he's happy to be in Fort Worth and looking forward to connecting with the community. So here. Hey, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, Y'all are so friendly. You've welcomed me openly to your group. I'm really looking forward to be um, uh, a member of the club. Thank you. All right, and now is the main part of the program. We love John Avila. He's a well-regarded community leader. Come join us on stage. Chairman Thomas S. Byrne, and I believe, help me with my military ranks. He's an Army Brigadier General, and he's going to help us introduce our program. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce Tom Kilgannon. He's a leader of America's charitable community and an advocate for those who serve our country. He has spent his career supporting the humble heroes of a great nation and helping good people experience the joy of philanthropic giving. Tom serves as the president of the Freedom Alliance, an educational and charitable organization which honors and supports America's military and promotes a strong national defense. Freedom Alliance saves lives and military marriages by providing recreational rehabilitation to combat wounded veterans, heroes, and counseling retreats for military couples. The organization also helps troops overcome the wounds of war through a variety of initiatives, including giving all-terrain wheelchairs to amputees, donating mortgage-free homes to combat wounded veterans, and shipping care packages to troops deployed overseas, amongst other projects. Tom is a graduate of New York University, has appeared on numerous television and radio programs. He has published dozens of opinion columns and is the author of Diplomatic Divorce, Why America Should End Its Love Affair with the United Nations. Please help me in welcoming Tom Kilgannon. How was that? How was that? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, General. And thank you all. For having me here. 
There we go. Thank you all for having me here. It's, a, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here. I've heard so much about this club. I've uh, spoken to many Rotaries, but I've never addressed the best one in America. So thank you all. This is, uh, this is really great. I want to, um, you know, I got here because I met one of your members, Mark Maurer, and he and I have uh, developed a friendship over the last several years. And uh, he asked, you know, would I be interested in speaking to uh, the Rotary? And I said, absolutely. Uh, Mark couldn't be here today. Uh, he is taking um, his eldest daughter to visit a school in <coughs> Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> but he's, uh, I I'm really thankful to him for, for having me here, to Sean. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, I just wanted to uh, also introduce uh, one of my teammates, Greg Blackwell, who's here. Greg. Um, Greg is here in the Fort Worth area, and he left uh, some of our our newsletters uh, that are uh, out in the uh, opening. Uh, so if you if you like what you hear here today, then please pick up a newsletter, get to know Freedom Alliance a little bit better. If you don't like what you hear here today, just file a formal complaint with Mark Maurer, and uh, we'll see uh, what happens there. So. Um, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about the work that we do at Freedom Alliance. And uh, I'm pleased also to have a member of our board of directors here with us, Ed Daly, uh, who is over here, lives in the area. <clears throat> and Freedom Alliance, is, as the general said, is a, a charitable organization. And we are doing all that we can to help military families and combat veterans overcome the wounds of war. I had a great day earlier this week. I was in Shelbyville, Tennessee, where Freedom Alliance, along with our partners, awarded a mortgage-free home to a young man in Shelbyville. It's a new construction, four bedrooms, two and a half baths. And this is one of the programs we have at Freedom Alliance, where we are able to uh, work with combat veterans and help them overcome their injuries. Now, in in this individual's case, his injuries are um, both physical and emotional. And this home is going to help him to provide for his family, to care for them, to rehabilitate more fully, and to afford a home that he otherwise could not afford. He is relocated from the Northeast down to Tennessee. And um, when we went to see the home for the first time, we went in the backyard and he almost came to tears as he looked at the size of the backyard, something he did not have in his previous home. And he said, now I can watch my kids play in the yard and play safely. And that is the kind of joy that uh, comes to service members when they get this these kinds of gifts. This is just uh, one of numerous programs that we have at Freedom Alliance. As the general mentioned, we are also helping with providing um, customized all-terrain wheelchairs. These are chairs that look like tanks. They have these big thick threads on them so that veterans can get on them and get out to the places they love. Go out into the woods, go to the beach, go to the lake, uh, work their farms because they just don't have uh, the mobility. In many cases, they're amputees, single or double amputees. In other cases, the toll of military service over 10 or 12 or 15 deployments has made their, their body just unable to walk long distances or carry the kinds of things that they need, so we give them that. We are providing uh, loan-free vehicles and helping them in that way, but really, the, the thing I wanted to talk about this morning is the kinds of activities we're providing to veterans to address their moral injury or their emotional injury. And that is, these are injuries of the heart, of the soul, where they have seen and experienced things in combat that no individual should have to ever see or experience. They're the kinds of things that are even too gruesome to mention in polite company, but they have seen it. And the memories that they carry home from these uh, experiences impact their ability to live a healthy life. So it impacts their, uh, their ability to 
get a good night's sleep, to hold a job, to keep their attention on certain things. And so Freedom Alliance is providing retreats and outings to one, bring them together, and two, help them to be in the company of others who have experienced the same thing. We try to earn their trust and put them in an environment where they are comfortable and confident that when they begin talking about these experiences, they're doing so in a safe place. And so that is why we have dozens and dozens of hunting and fishing outings uh, all year long. We have online meetings for veterans so that they can talk about them. We have sort of a graduated series where they begin with one type of event and work toward another. <clears throat> and we want to help them. I think the, uh, the idea that I would want to leave you with today is that our help for the veteran community is needed more than ever before. Um, they are still hurting. They are still uh, going through a great deal. And in these last several years, these emotional injuries, the, the, their anxieties have been pegged, their confidence has dropped because of events that are taking place across our country. In 2020, we had the, the beginning of the pandemic and the domestic unrest, and then we also had uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the 20th commemoration of 9-11, and all of these types of events really impacted them in a way that jarred them, that made them feel like they were back in combat or gave them or took away the confidence that they had developed. Now, some people will say, you know, it's been 20 years since the start of the war in Iraq and even longer with Afghanistan, how is it that these needs are still so so great? Well, if you were uh, one of those individuals who deployed in the early years of the war and you came home wounded, you spent a number of years just worrying about your, your physical rehabilitation. You were in the hospital, you went through dozens of surgeries, you probably went through several years of rehab, and that continues for a long time. Then you go through a series of events in your life where you're uh, working on your marriage, you're trying to get a job, uh, and then only many years later, after you reach a comfort level in all of those areas, do they get to a point where these demons, as they call them, begin to attack and frustrate them? and that's when we have to have our alerts up. So some of those events that I mentioned, when they happened at Freedom Alliance, our phones were ringing off the hook and we needed to give our attention to them. We give them homes, we give them vehicles, and we give them grants. But the most important, the most valuable thing that we can give to a veteran or to any fellow American is our time and our attention because that's what they need. That's our most valuable resource, and that helps them through. And we have a whole series of events and activities to help them through that, to keep them alive, to keep them active, to keep them healthy in their relationships. Secondly, at Freedom Alliance, we are, we are also remembering those who did not come home. And we do that primarily through a scholarship program that gives college tuition to the sons and daughters of American heroes. Since this, the attacks of 9-11, Freedom Alliance has awarded more than $20 million in college assistance to kids who've had a parent who was killed or disabled in military service. That is something we are very proud of because that scholarship not only helps them with their college tuition, but each scholarship is a reminder that their parents' sacrifice will never be forgotten by a grateful nation. And these are, this is just some of the work that we're doing at Freedom Alliance, but it, it's all uh, about helping and providing practical support, but also remembering that we must always honor those who are serving. And you all here in Fort Worth Rotary understand service as well as anybody and the importance of it. And I just, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to pay tribute to those who serve our country in so many different ways. And you know, that service is, you can define it in a lot of ways, 
but uh, a good place to look is the preamble to the Constitution, where we talk about uh, the need to provide for the common defense, ensure domestic tranquility, and promote the general welfare. Now, those, those three responsibilities need to be filled with quality, good, dedicated, inspirational people who fill those roles and fill those jobs and bring energy and patriotism and love for their fellow Americans to it. And that is something, uh, the, the, the variety of ways in which people serve our country was something that was crystallized for me uh, on a dark day in American history, and that was September 11th of 2001 where that morning I was actually on a plane. I was making my way from Detroit back to Washington, D.C., and it was Northwest Airlines flight number 238. It's the only boarding pass I've ever kept uh, in all my travels. <clears throat> and we were headed from uh, Detroit back to Reagan National Airport. We were one of the last planes that took off that morning because shortly after we took off, the first plane hit the first tower in New York City and somewhere along the way the second plane hit the second tower. As we approached the DC area, we were told that we were being diverted out to Dulles Airport, and when we got to Dulles Airport, we were told the reasons why. And later, as I had a chance to reflect on it <clears throat> and what happened that day, it really occurred to me how grateful I was to so many different people. You think about the air traffic controllers who made history by bringing down thousands of flights in record period of time without a plan to do so. You think about the Secret Service who went on heightened alert protecting the president, vice president, and their families. You think about the pilots who protected the airspace over DC and the charitable organizations that set up food trucks and blood banks and uh, emergency facilities and our diplomats overseas who had to harden our embassies uh, just in case any of them were attacked. And all these people are committed to the idea of serving our country and making it better. And often we don't think about them, but that service is something that you're committed to, we're committed to at Freedom Alliance, but I think it's in jeopardy in many ways. It's struggling, and we're not teaching our young people the value of that service as much as we can. It's being reflected in the very difficult recruiting environment that the military is going through right now. Last year, America's military had the worst recruiting effort in two generations. It has been 50 years since we transferred to the all-volunteer force, and this, this past year reflected the, the worst recruiting that we have had since that time. The Army missed its recruiting goals by 25%. Each of the other services, they'll tell you that they met their goals, but it's, as uh, a president from Texas once said, fuzzy math in many cases. And what they do is they, they set a goal and then midway through the year when they realize they're not going to meet it, they go to Congress and say, well, we've adjusted our goal. And then at the end of the year, they say, oh, well, you know, we actually met it. But they've, they fell short in um, at least one category. The Marines made their goal by eight recruits. And this year, the following year, the Air Force has already announced, we're going to miss all our goals. Don't even expect it. But the way that the other services, quote unquote, made their goals last year was by dipping into their delayed entry pools, which means that those who would have been brought up this year um, were brought up last year. So the burden gets even higher and even stronger for them to be able to do that. Now, there's a lot of reasons uh, for this, but I think one of the biggest reasons is that we just don't have the number of people that we need to recruit from. The target audience for recruiting is young Americans age 18 to 24. And if you look at the numbers for that demographic, there are roughly 32 million Americans who are age 18 to 24. So if you take, <clears throat> if you take this backdrop and you consider that the universe of 32 million people that the 
Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and now the Space Force have to recruit from. This represents, this whole backdrop represents 32 million people. But, as the general will tell you, not anybody can join the military. There are certain qualifications. One of those qualifications is you have to be physically fit. So if you exclude all of those who are not physically fit and able to join the military, you would eliminate about two thirds of that 32 million. You'd be left with a sliver about that big of about 9 million people. From there, you also have to have the grades. You have to be academically qualified. Of that 9 million who are physically fit, you would exclude about half of that. So just take the bottom half. Now you're left with a, a corner about that big of about 4.4 million kids 18 to 24 years old. That's the pool that they have to draw from. But it gets even worse because of that 4.4 million who are both physically and academically qualified, you have to have a pool of applicants who are actually interested, what the military recruiters call propensed, which means they have, they're physically fit, they're academically qualified, and they've actually thought about it and considered joining the military. From that small area of 4.4 million, you would whittle that down to about 465,000. From a universe of 32 million, you have about 465,000 who are qualified and interested in joining the military. From that 465,000, all its services have to draw about 200,000 a year, which means they have to meet, you know, hit a target of about 50%, which is unheard of. Now, the recruiters are doing the right thing by targeting that small group that has the qualifications and the interest from a tactical perspective, but from a strategic perspective, we're losing our way. And the nation's leadership really needs to be focused on this. The President, the De Secretary of Defense, the Congress of the United States really needs to give more attention to that universe of 32 million and make sure that when you whittle down that you have a group that is much bigger than that 465,000. I think the President of the United States should declare a national imperative such that we're bringing government, business, community organizations, uh, education uh, schools and the education uh, industry together so that we are getting kids physically fit, we get physical ed back into the schools, that we're teaching them, giving them the right knowledge that they need to have, getting them to eat healthier, and teaching them about the wide variety of opportunities that are available to them in military service. If we can get more of that 32 million interested and qualified for military service, it doesn't mean they have to, it means they have a choice of whether or not they want to serve or not. And if they do meet those qualifications, what does that mean? That means they have a better opportunity to be a firefighter or a police officer or any other kind of service opportunity that they might want to have. It just means that we make our, our younger generation healthier, stronger, better educated, and more ready to take on the world. So um, there's a lot that goes into it, but that's what, uh, that's what concerns me. And by the way, all of those statistics, the 32 million and, and the 9 million, they're all headed in the wrong direction which means that ultimate universe is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And similar stories are true of firefighters, local police forces, nurses, teachers, all of whom are having a more and more difficult time recruiting the people they need to staff those social services that our communities need and rely on. It was mentioned here earlier how much we're relying on our local police. But 
Police forces all across the country are throwing money at potential recruits, are uh, struggling to find ways to bring more people onto the force. In my community of Fairfax, Virginia, uh, they're offering $15,000 bonuses to anybody who wants to be a police officer. So I'm concerned, but I'm also, uh, I also know that our young people are talented, they're capable, and I think we should be asking more of them. I think they want to do better, they want to excel, and we can do that. Jack Kennedy, when he was president, he said when it comes to solving the nation's problems that he was not going to uh, look at what he would force the American people to do. He was more focused on what he would ask of them. And I think that's the mindset that we need to have. And so if we have time, I'll take a question or two, but otherwise, thank you for having me here. Can you stick around for questions? So in the interest of time, he can certainly stick around for questions and I, and I hope that you will take him up on that. Um, Tom, thank you very much for traveling in from Washington, D.C. to be, with, be, be here with us today. And what I hear is a call for action and really a crisis in our military. And if we weren't aware of it already, we certainly are now. Thank you again for all the work you do on behalf of the um, men and women who are protecting us. And at the end of the day, we all know that our military is fundamentally only as strong as each individual soldier, each individual uh, officer. Um, thank you again. It is uh, an honor to have you here, and it is a tradition of the Rotary Club of Fort Worth to make a donation in, uh, in the honor of each program speaker, and right now we're doing that to the Polio Plus Fund, and here's a memento of that donation for you. Thank you very much. So we'll wrap it up quickly. I wanted to especially thank our Veterans Committee sponsors again today. The committee manages the club's resources earmarked for projects benefiting local veterans, service members, and their families in need. One such project is to provide shelters to homeless veterans. Contact Dick Rudell or Aurora if you'd like to join the committee or to make donations. Remember also to donate to the endowment and the Veterans Endowment when you pay your membership dues. Thank you especially to the Veterans and uh, Military Affairs Committee, and especially those who are behind this sponsorship. Chairman Dick Riddell, committee members Carol Del Real, Bill Fairley, and Don Click. Next week's program, Leah King, President and CEO, United Way Tarrant County, they're celebrating their 100 year anniversary. The board, um, today's board meeting will be in the President's boardroom on the 11th floor, and as is our tradition this year, um, we are taking a moment for peace, compliments of the Georgetown Rotary Club. Choose the single clenched fist lifted and ready, or the open hand held out and waiting choose for we meet by one or the other words by american poet carl sandberg and with that this meeting is adjourned we'll see you next week <laughs>